have a sermon <clears throat> that I've been praying about. And on the way here, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me. And all of a sudden, I said, man, I, I just kind of, it's, it's just hard driving and Googling at the same time, you know, and you're alone in the car. I don't. I, I told Tim, I said, Tim, pull this up. And he pulled part of it up, but he's only got a small part. So and what's really cool is they can actually go with me to Exodus uh, chapter 2. He only has like verse 1 through 5. But from St. Louis, they can actually talk to this computer and put it up there, which is really kind of crazy. They can tell me, you know, get your hands out of your pocket. <laughs> they can do anything they want to do up there. So give it up for all the tech people, all the sound people. Here's what, here's what the Lord said to me. You know, I, my heart's broken, your heart's broken. When you think about the shooting that just happened there in Nashville and it's senseless and it's demonic and it's the devil. And, and we know it's the devil. It certainly wasn't the Lord. The devil comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And then, you know, those things just get so politicized and it goes down all these different trails. And in, in, in reality, um, the Lord has a protection plan for us. And I pray for anybody that was struck or hurt. But I don't want you living in any fear. Because the Bible said there is no fear in the perfect love of God. Amen. So first of all, for Christians, you know, if you threaten us, like, I'm going to kill you. And you're saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, you're like, please do. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I mean, yeah, what are you waiting on, right? My gas bills do. I was getting ready to fill up my Bronco. <laughs> All right, okay. But we know that we're called to live in the last days. And I was, I was just, the Lord began to speak to me about baptism. And it's, gonna, it's, it's almost hard for me to unpack because it's in my mind, in my spirit. But you think about we, we got baptisms coming up real soon. You should sign up for that. Even I think baptism... Um, is something that, of course, biblically, every believer should do. But I think any time there's a broken relationship with you and Jesus, I say do it again. Wow. It's just like renewing your vows. Uh, it just, just do it again. There's something about the immersion, and we saw that represented in Jesus' death, his burial, and resurrection. We're getting ready to do that with, you know, Good Friday. We always, at Good Friday, go to church because we love the Lord. Can I get an Amen. amen. And then we go on Easter because we love the Lord Amen. and we love our friends and we don't want our friends to go to hell. And, um, but when Jesus died and he was buried and then he was resurrected, that is a, a representation of water baptism. And if you're not water baptized, you need to do it. And I was thinking about that, and then, and then I was thinking about, uh, and it got a beautiful sermon, as I said, written out, but God began to speak to me about the protection aspect in the life of Moses. So, so let's go there. Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. About this time, a man and a woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the son was a special baby, and she kept him hidden for three months. Now, number one... It's hard to keep a baby hidden for three months. Yeah, right. yeah. We can't keep Liam quiet on an airplane for 30 minutes. Come on, raise your hand if you're not for time. How in the world, when it, all the babies are supposed to be killed, aborted, trashed, thrown in the river, somehow you can keep a baby quiet for three months. So this is a miracle. She saw that she was a special baby. She kept him hidden for three months. But, but when, when she couldn't no longer hide him, she got a basket made of reeds, she pitched it, waterproofed it with tar, and she put the baby in a basket on the bank and let it go. Now, first of all, just think how much faith this would take to take your little baby that you love so much and you put this little joker in this basket and it's going down the river. Now, as you kind of think about that at school, people thought, you know, t tomorrow, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? This was a Christian school. This was this. This is that. What am I going to do with my baby? Taking my baby, taking my life. See, the enemy wants to get you to live in fear so that you stay home and that you're afraid. 
But when you're full of faith, you're like, hey, I'm fine putting this little, he's the cutest little baby she had ever seen. She loved this little baby so much. She had talked to little Mo. She had rubbed Mo's head. She had fed little Mo. And then now she got to put little Mo in a basket and trust God. But let me tell you, you can trust him. St. Louis, I promise you, you can trust him. He's so trustworthy. In verse 4, it says, The baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter, you know, that whole family's in charge of killing babies, came down to bathe in the river with her attendant walking alongside. And all of a sudden now she sees this basket and she sent her maid, as she's bathing in the river, she sends her maid to go get the baby. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby, the little boy, and he was crying and she felt sorry for him and said, this must be one of the little Hebrew babies. We're supposed to like be killing this baby, but she looks at this girl on the sideline who just happens to be baby Mo's sister you can't make this stuff up, y'all. This is God's supernatural provision and protection. And all of a sudden now his sister there, which theologians say she was either between 8 and 12 years old. And so she's, she's sitting there, and then she has the wisdom to say, hey, would you like me to go find a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby? In verse 8, the king's daughter said, yes, I do. So the girl went and called, guess who? The baby mama. She, she, she took this baby and she put it in the hands of God. She put it in that little bitty basket, which if you study it out, it's actually technically called an ark. And we know that God had used an ark before to save people in water. It's not even an accident at all that little Moses here is now in this river, in water, and they say, we'll call him Moses because this will be drawing out of water, but God knew, actually, I'm going to call him this because at some point, my people are going to have a bunch of enemies chasing them, and they're going to go through some water, and when they go through water, he's been in water since he was a little bit, someone, somebody in St. Louis ought to shout amen to them. There's something significant, Ferguson, about the washing of the water of the word. There's something about lifting up your hands and just praising God and taking a spiritual bath. Walking down the road, praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord, turning off secular music, and then just being compliant with what God wants you to do. I don't know if you've ever heard of a singer named Torrin Wells. Anybody ever heard of him? You know, Hills and Valleys and so on. And he, he's a friend and he asked if he could come stay at my house for three days. And so he did. So over the last three days, he's been at our house. And this morning, I fed him and clothed him and took care of him. And I'm like, today's the day you're going to sing Hills and Valleys on the piano. And uh, he did. And I was asking him about that song. He said there was a point in his life where he was raised in church and the power of God, listen to me now, and yet at the same time he could see that his vocals and his ability and his love for lost people that he could cross over and he tried to cross over and he, he, all of a sudden now he's crossing over, opening up for all these big names and filling stadiums, but it's still not really hitting like it needs to hit. Wow. And he said that, I said, I just began to pray and I said, God, what do you want for me? And he said, I would like you to write a song that would be only for Christians about hills and valleys. And so he went into a room and wrote that song that is iconic. And it ministered to all these people. And then all of a sudden now, Steph Curry and all these other famous people are going through trouble. And somebody had sent them a YouTube of the song. And people played it in birthing rooms that are famous. And the thing that he really didn't want to do, he actually did do. And the thing that God wanted him to do exploded him into a total different realm and place to where the provision of God was on his life. And he's doing good in the hood. 
so, so, so here's my point to you at all of our campuses. Just because it looks like that you're, you're just aimlessly wandering down the river in a basket... Maybe God sees all the way in the future of your life and says, I need you to go through this so you learn to trust me so that you can go through that and then you will be a deliverer, not just for you, come on somebody, but a lot of other people. So the thing that you you, that you're feel like you're going through right now is not even about the thing you're going through, it's about the thing that you're going to. So that's why you gotta say, don't grow weary in well-doing. I, 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 Little Jacobed, that's Mo's mama's name. That had to be a hard day. Tears, guys, let's face it, tears had to be rolling down her eyes. She thought, I'm never going to see this baby again. But the only chance in the world he's got is if I just trust God and put him in his basket and just let him go. And when she lets him go, God uses the devil's money to educate him. He's sitting up at the king's table, and she's actually getting to be his caregiver. She would have never gotten paid to breastfeed him, but now she's on salary for something that she was doing for free. Thank you so much. And now the whole family, he's getting the proper education. He's learning all about diplomacy. He's learning bureaucracy. He's learning everything that he knows that will affect his life later to be the leader that God will take to the mountaintop and give him the Ten Commandments. And he wouldn't have been able to write that down had him not been educated. But she trusted him. So I guess my point is, at some point, you just got to go, I trust you. I don't understand you, but I trust you. There at sunset, I remember one of the first times, I, and I talked about it last Tuesday night, that I was there, 2,400 seats. Can you imagine, like, picture this building right here, 2,400 times bigger. And I'm sitting in that building and God's speaking to me, telling me he's going to use me to do this. And I don't feel educated enough. And I just bought Earth City and it took all the faith I had and even more than I had. And I, I could still even hear my biological father say, what are you doing? Because sometimes the hereditary things that were so, and your parents didn't mean anything by it, but they're small thinking and the way they were raised affects the way God wants to go in there and rewire your brain and go, hey, that was your dad, but I'm your father and I am here to tell you that I'm going to take care of you. Come on. I'm going to get you adopted. I'm going to get your education paid for. I'm going to actually check you into a room you can never, ever afford. None of this came to me except on the way here. I have a beautiful sermon that I'd love to get to, but I got a feeling we might not. As you read this entire account of Moses' life, and if you study his life, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that those first five books of the Bible, five means grace and favor. Those five books are called the Pentateuch, and those only became and were only birthed out of a little boy that was dropped in a basket. We wouldn't have all the things <laughs> that we need to know about Levitical law, about priesthood. We wouldn't know nothing if that guy would have been killed. Wow. But God said, no, I'm not going to allow that to happen. So now let's put it in our world. Some of you are going through brain cancer, other people through aneurysms, other people through divorce, other people through, man, my, my kid's on drugs, my, my kid's bound by porn, me and my husband don't get along. You got all this stuff that's telling you this is dead. But if you could just tonight say, God, I trust you. It's way bigger. When I looked at Sunset Hills, way bigger than I thought I could ever have. 
I still don't go down in the basement. Maybe some of you tonight, you could take an elevator. By the way, that elevator was $200,000 that I didn't have. But if you take the elevator down to the basement and go over to the left side, there's a whole room as big as this room that I'm in. And it's got big um, electrical machines in it. I don't even know what they call them. But they're like 12, 14 foot tall. And it says, don't touch danger. And it's going right now. Because the air units that it takes to run those big motor scooters, it's crazy. So I don't even go down there. Because I can't pay the bill. But if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Somehow, some way, every month, he pays the bills. And then he extends our, somebody ought to shout amen. He extends your finances. Then you start tithing, you start giving, your business starts growing. And then for real, it just all works out. So one, if it looks like you've got to give up on the dream, it's not giving up, it's planning it. Plan it, let it float. Use some wisdom anywhere you can to have somebody watch. The young girl watched, but their ultimate trust was in God. Psalms 107, let's go there. St. Louis and Ferguson, 107, 29, it says, he, talking of God, hushes the storm to a calm, to a gentle whisper, so that the waves of the sea are still. I, I, I don't want people to raise their hands right now because I want you to be in the privacy of your own little situation. But I believe that I've, if I had my people raise their hands, there'd be a lot of people saying, man, I'm in the middle of the storm. There's, it's loud and it's scary. It's dark and it's ominous. He hushes and calms the storm. But he doesn't do it by himself. He expects us to speak as a speaking spirit and say, Storm, I'm speaking to you right now. Now, I'm not coming to you in my name because you know what? I'm no match for the devil, but I'm actually coming in the authority that is invested in me as a representative in the earth realm of Jesus Christ. So whatever I bind, you don't even have to yell either. Like I saw somebody on TikTok, they, had, they were praying. And it, I'm not making fun of them. It just popped up on my TikTok. And then they had like a sword and they were like swinging a sword. And another guy was ringing a bell and they're like speaking in tongues. And, blah, 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 blah. and they, they were just so in the flesh. And it was kind of cute, but pretty crazy. And I thought, it doesn't take all that. Amen. That's weird. The Holy Ghost isn't weird. Weird people make the Holy Ghost weird. These were weird people, and they exhibited weirdness. What they were doing, though, I knew their heart was good, but they were way off of the flesh. So you ain't got to be like, oh, I got to uh, uh, wear myself out. I got I, I to gotta yell. No, no, no. Uh, like some of the most powerful people I've ever seen never had to yell. Wow. I've just seen really powerful people tell people, don't ever do that again. And we all knew. I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You have authority. Everybody shout, I have authority. I have authority. Psalms 89 verse 9. This is good, St. Louis. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves arise, you still them. Still them. I've had a lot of sleepless nights in my day. I have um, been through a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, don't want to go through all my little stories, but I mean, y'all would think that I've probably had a lot of stuff happen in my life. Huh? They don't give you these churches. <laughs> you fight devils, you fight cities, you fight families. There's a lot. And a lot of times the enemy, I'm talking to somebody right now, the enemy will try to hammer on you in the middle of the night. When you're alone, when you kind of, you're laying down, it's dark, it's quiet, and the storm starts raging. And that's why I really like a good old-fashioned hard Bible. This woman here, let me see your Bible just one minute. It's a pretty little pink Bible. It's beautiful. <laughs> 
It's a nice Bible. It's wore out because she's not. But I've been known to just sleep like this. I've been known to sleep like this. I've been known to sleep like this. I've been known to sleep like this. I've been known, I don't want to violate her Bible, but I've been known to stick it in my pants <laughs> and walk around with it in my back. People say, is he carrying? <laughs> yeah, I'm carrying, buddy. This thing here will do more for you than a 357, a Glock. It'll do more for you than a court. It'll do more for you than a doctor. It'll do more for you than a pain pill. You all just love it. Now, if you're a man, don't get a pink one. But you calm yourself down. Now, I want to talk about medicine. In a church this big, you got some people like, oh, you don't have any faith. You're taking medicine. I believe in medicine. I believe if a woman's having a baby and they offer an epidural, like, see, as you find out you're pregnant, I would start seeing when can you start getting small doses, small. And then once you get to full term, I'm, I'm saying, you stab me in the back early. Come on, somebody. I don't want to feel nothing. <laughs> Come on, raise your hand. And you got other people like, well, I'm a woman of faith. I'm not going to have any pain. Well, you know, more power to you. Maybe, maybe that's not the case for you. I've seen some people just be like, oh, my God, my water broke. Can't even get to the hospital. Have a baby like a cop or a cab driver is dropping the kid in a cab. People are different. <laughs> but how many women at our church, how many years it was a different experience. So never allow the enemy, when you're going through a raging storm, keep you from getting medicinal help. Wow. Take it in faith. So if you you got something going on and the doctor says, hey, this right here would help you calm your nerves down, take down the swelling, bring down the inflammation, then you say, I believe in God, but I'm also taking that in the name of Jesus. And there'll be a day I don't have to take it anymore. Does that make sense to you? I'm all for it, man. If I'm hurting, man, I'm like, hey, thank you, Jesus. And whatever you can shoot me with right now, hit me hard. Hit me two times. I don't want to feel it. In fact, I, I like that comedian. said he went to the doctor and I forget exactly what happened. He said, never go to the doctor. And they're like, what's the pain level? Like a two? You know, is it a three? He said, always say, it's a 10. It's a 10. Because he said, there'll be some other guy next to you, you know, screaming, oh, God, help me. He said, if you don't out scream that guy, you don't get the drugs you need. So, <laughs> it's a 10. I shouldn't have told you that. I thought it was funny. And in the right scenario, I'd ask God to forgive me and I'd use it. Come on, somebody. Matthew 8. You with me, St. Louis? Yeah. But Jesus said, 22, to them, follow me, leave the dead in sin to bury their own dead. And after this, he got out of the boat, and he and his disciples followed him. And all of a sudden, quickly, without any warning, unexpectedly, suddenly, behold, there arose a violent storm of the sea, and the boat being covered by waves... But he was sleeping. So sometimes in life, stuff hits you just quick. You ever been absolutely fine, got a phone call, and all of a sudden now your stomach went, <gasps> raise your hand if you've ever been through something. Got home, got a certified letter, and you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but if you can stay calm, if you can train your brain to stay calm, it helps heal quicker, time pass quicker, because most of the things, listen to me, most of the things that the devil told you he's going to do to you, 
he just doesn't have he just he doesn't have that kind of currency. He's writing checks he can't cash. So it's like when the devil says something, I'm going to do this, going to do that. Here's the good news. I usually laugh because I go, well, that's good to know because now I know that's not going to happen. You're going to die early. I'm like, I better start saving my money because I'm going to live a long time. <laughs> Come on, raise your hand if it makes sense. He's a liar. The Bible said he's a father of liars. Every camp is shouted. He's a father of liars. He's not just a liar. He's the father of the lie. So a storm hits you unexpectedly, you didn't expect it, what do you do? Well, you're a leader. You got to chill all the time. I had a $2 million unexpected surprise hit me not too long ago in the ministry. $2 million. He's talking about jacking with your day. What? And when you do, when that kind of stuff happens, you start wanting to blame people. First thing you do is you get upset and you start blaming people. Well, it was, it was a contractor. It was the government. It, it was Trump. It was Biden. It was Pelosi. It was Kennedy. It was Reagan. It was Carter. Come on, somebody. It was the missile crisis. It was... Don't blame. Just go, you know what? This was a surprise to me, but it wasn't a surprise to God. This sudden, violent storm... God, God has never woke up and said, you got to be kidding me. When did this happen? I was just checking my Instagram feed. Holy Ghost, did you see this? We got bank foreclosures. Come on, raise your hand. People shooting people in school. Huh? No, God's never said that. God's never said, uh-oh. <laughs> he just said, he said, well, uh-oh. He's never said, oh, no. Oh. No. He's never, he's never surprised. That's right. Good word. So the more you can act like you're not surprised. Amen. By the way, I'm not getting a lot of things, but I am the king of acting like I'm not surprised. I fly airplanes, and if you act surprised, it scares the crap out of people. <laughs> Stuff falls off, bad things happen. You can't go, oh! You got to tell everybody, we're good. I was driving a UTV St. Louis Monday and I kind of came up on a tree. I thought we could just go right over. And it was bigger than I thought. Well, immediately the UTV kind of climbed it and went up just straight up like this. And Ashley was with me and she grabs the steering wheel in my hand and goes, ah! And I grabbed her while I could control the UTV, pull it down, and control her. And I said, you're okay. And she's like, don't do that. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Truth is, I was scared too, but you can't tell that's your daughter. <laughs> Come on, raise your hand. You know what? I do this all the time. That's when you pull up your shirt and say, I got this. The more you can keep yourself calm, the better decisions you're going to make. Come on, Ferguson. Does it make sense to you? The less fear, because as soon as fear comes, your legs go numb, your mind goes dumb, and you're out of control. Violent storm comes, verse 24, one more time. It's beating the fire out of the boat. And Jesus is sleeping. Because when he got on the boat, he said, hey, we're going to the other side. And that settled it. So if God led you to go to this church, led you to tithe, by the way, everything that's in his word, he led you to do that. Go to church, it's in the Bible. You know, but the Lord didn't lead me to do that. Well, if he didn't read his book, okay? <laughs> he, he'll lead you to tithe, serve, Stay out of sin. Obey the Holy Spirit. By the way, a lot of storms, thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking that to me. He just told me right there. He said a lot of storms are self-inflicted storms. You bind in a storm that you started. Come on, somebody. Verse 25. 
And then they went and they awakened him saying, Lord, rescue and preserve us. We're perishing. So I, I, want, you to, I want you to look at that. If you are perishing, what you don't need to say is, we're perishing. Because the Bible said you're going to live and not die. So if you are dying, don't say you're dying. Keep saying, I'm living. Because even if you did die, you'd still be living because you'd be going to heaven or hell. You're still alive. You never die. So you got to be careful. That's why the Bible said we're snared by the words of our mouth. Such good teaching. Snare by the words of our mouth. We eat good by the fruit of our lips. We have not because we ask not. Let us say unto the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea and not doubt in our heart. But believe those things which we say shall come to pass and we will have whatsoever we say. And the more you say it, the more you believe it. You know, just walk around saying, if you said it, we believe it. Sing it, say it, spray it, believe it. Just walk around and go, look what God's doing. Look what God did. Look what God's about to do. You say, well, what if he doesn't do it? Well, what if he does? So that's good. 26, we're getting close to done. St. Louis, wave at me if you want me to do some more. Come on. I want to know. It's early there. It's 8.55 here. You guys are 7.55. I don't know what you're griping about. Come on. <laughs> Verse 25. So they got all scared, worked up. And so they went and they awakened Jesus. And said, Lord, rescue us, preserve us. We're perishing. Notice that you don't have to wake up Jesus all the time. You don't have to call Pastor Phil. You don't have to call Pastor Micah. You don't have to call Pastor Nia, Pastor Ryan. There's nothing wrong with texting him, calling him, Pastor Greg, call Austin. You can call, but you don't have to. I don't call people. Pray for me. Bless me. I got a couple people I could call. And they actually tell me, why do you never call me? I don't know. I just don't want to bother you. I figure, you know. I know the Lord just like you know the Lord. I was talking to the Lord about it and didn't feel necessary to bother you about it. And they're like, well, I wish you'd call me. Well, I'll call you about something else, you know. We talk about four-wheelers, motorcycles, something. But I don't need, and that's, please hear me, it's not pride. I'm not too prideful to call. But you ought to grow in grace to where you have confidence in your prayer and, and not prideful confidence. You just know if I said it, that's the way it's going to be. Just lay hands on it. Lay hands on your dog. Our dog, Nicole's little dog. I'll tell you this story if you don't know. Some of you've heard it, but you're going to hear it again. <laughs> Nicole got this little dog. So cute. Weighed a couple pounds, took it everywhere with us. Take it to the bank, let it ride the tube. <laughs> a little bit. I mean, this dog would never. She loved this dog so much. She put on this dog, and uh, and this dog just get violent with the towel, and you dry off at the shower, go crazy. And and she accidentally like the dog had grabbed the towel, and she like was trying to teach the dog not to do it. You know, she said, "Luppy, stop it!" And she whipped the towel around when she did that. Just that dog just flew across the room. <laughs> And hit her head on the edge of the, 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 the travertine and died. Killed the dog. Nicole's standing there screaming, Lubby's dead, Lubby's dead, oh God, Lubby's dead. And I knew at that point, even in Nicole's life, right then she'd been under a lot of stress. The last thing she needed was a dead dog. I jumped out of the shower, grabbed that dog. And I just went over in our bedrooms. I said, Father, I think a dog's lost all its fluid, tongues hanging out of its mouth. I said, Father, I, I just, and I'm going back to what my, this is why it's important to go to church. And this is why it's important to hear stories with people that have had past victories. My grandmother would always tell me this story about how her dog got hit by a car. She put it in the basement, freaked out, prayed, 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 finally 
gave up and the dog come walking up the stairs later that night. So I just tapped my faith into that because I could, Nicole's still screaming. So I'm tr pr trying to pray and she's going, Luffy's dead, Luffy's dead. Oh God, I killed Luffy. So I got Luffy and I was running through that. I said, oh God, I thank you, Lord. If you raised that dog from the dead, my grandmother's dog, God, I thank you that Luffy right now, that life's coming back to Luffy's body. I speak life, God. God, this dog, God, it was an accident. She didn't mean to do that, Lord. She loves this dog right now. I'm going to town. Two or three minutes, and Nicole's still screaming, Luffy's dead! Luffy's dead! And I wanted to shut her up, like, shut up! But I was like, oh, she doesn't need to say, shut up! And by that time, all of a sudden, Luffy's tongue moved, and I went, whoa, praise God! And then all of a sudden, her eyes started moving, and I'm like, Luffy's not dead! And then she runs over to me and takes me. She said, oh, be careful, be careful. I need to take her to the vet. I said, well, the vet can't help her. She was dead. <laughs> Give me one more minute with the dog. <laughs> God raised up the news. She went to Palm Beach Clinic and they charged her $900 to tell her the dog was okay. <laughs> I was like, That happened. True story. Happened just like that. A couple years later, I was at our house where we live now, and there was a Jewish man who I'd been working on getting saved, and he came to my house. Nicole was walking up the stairs with the dog, and trying to carry too much stuff, and she dropped Luppy on her head, and she died. She calls me screaming, Luffy's dead! You gotta pray, you gotta pray, you gotta pray! And I'm like, you know, I, I felt like I could that day. I don't know if it's because we're 1,100 miles away. I don't know what, but Luffy's gonna go to heaven. So I called Karen, Karen will tell you. I said, Karen, go get the dog, take the dog to the vet, have a proper burial. Do whatever needs to happen. I guess God could have done it again. I don't know. But I'm just telling you that God cares about what you care about. So if he can raise a dead dog, he could probably get your dead husband saved and get a job. Come on, somebody ought to shout amen. Come on, Ferguson. Come on, Sunset. True story. So what, you know, where did you get a dead dog from all that? Jesus was sleeping, man. The dude's tired. He's been working. Wow. And you guys got to go downstairs in the bottom of the boat and wake him up. And he got up there and he said, why didn't you guys do this? And he went to the helm of the ship and he said, peace, be still. And it said immediately it calmed down. Wow. And then I think he looked at them and said, that's how you do it. I'm going back to bed. <laughs> do that. So when your mind gets to racing in the middle of the night, just get up. Good word. Turn on the light. Say, so here, here's the deal, Mr. Devil. My room, my house, last time I checked, you have not helped me one time with the, with the rent. You haven't helped me with the cable bill. You haven't helped me with nothing. All you're doing is jacking with my sleep. The Bible said that God never sleeps and never slumbers. So since he's up and you're up, why don't you two talk? Homie's going to bed. And I'm going to go to bed right now in faith. Come on, somebody. And I'm going to wake up strong, blessed, healed, delivered. Some, somebody ought to shout amen right now. I think somebody ought to just, yeah! If he said it, we believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Last scripture. I'll let you go home. <laughs> Proverbs 3. How many glad you came to church? Raise your hand. Yes. It's fun. Sunset, I love you so much. You're so good. So good to me. I had so much fun this weekend. I actually preached really good Saturday night. 
and uh, didn't do so good for everybody on Sunday. I don't know. I, was, I, was, I, just, I felt like Saturday was a good one. Sometimes I think that I should just, and I'm telling you this just so you guys understand. There's certain times when you know it hits. It's just like, and, and you shouldn't trust it, but sometimes you should trust that. I'm like, oh, man, Earth City's going to be mad. Sunset's going to be upset if I don't go back and forth and then see me live. But just trust me. If I ever don't do it, it's not like, oh, I'm going to stay home and watch football. I hate football. I'm not going to watch football. I'm not going to watch bowling. If I, if I don't preach, it would be because, man, that one is going to like light your candle. So it's a side note, but how many of y'all make sense and trust me on that? Proverbs 3, 24, this is a good one. When you lie down, you shall not be afraid. Yes, you shall lie down and your sleep shall be restless. Oh, gosh. Sorry, homeschool. <sighs> when you lie down, your sleep will definitely have to have a lot of lunesta. <laughs> Melatonin. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Brother Copeland told me one time, he said, I was having trouble sleeping. And he said, then one day I just decided I could sleep by faith. Amen. So when I go to sleep, I say, I'm going to sleep right now by faith. And I just go to sleep, sleep all night. If you can walk by faith, you could lay down by faith. If you could lay down by faith, you could live by faith. If you can live by faith, you can talk by faith. If you can talk by faith, you can receive everything that God has promised to you by faith. Even if it looks like they're going to kill it, you can put it in God's hands Throw it in the river and let God take it down and then pay you. Nobody in here has been paid to nurse your child. But Jehoiakabed did. So maybe this is a new season for all of us to say. Let's enter into our job by faith, our health by faith, our safety by faith. We're just going to we're going to walk by faith. And we're going to trust God. By the way, online, when you're watching, I love it when you actually come to church, but if for some reason you have to watch for whatever reason, receive by faith and pay attention. Like don't allow your brain to kind of go over here and go over there because you got a brain and it's busy and it gets to going and you got to make it get back over. Get back over here and get this because when you renew your mind, you will be at the right place at the right time. And there'll be a time in your life to where you're so full of faith, you're not even afraid to die. Like people tell me all the time I'm afraid to die. I am so not afraid to die. Now, I, I love my life. I, I love to live. But I am so not scared at all about what happens when you die. How's it going to be when you die? Because I've watched people die. I've watched so many people die. I've watched people die beside their bed that go to our church. I've watched people die that was a violent accident. I've watched people die in front of me. I've watched people die, raise them, see them raised from the dead. I watched the lady at a drown and die in a lake. And um, my dad laid hands on her. The doctors couldn't do anything for her. And she was raised from the dead. And, I just, I'm just, I, they, they, they tell you the stories, man. My spirit just started coming out of my body and I started going towards this light. And then I've watched other people die. Uh, actually, the guy who owns huge hotels, if I said his name or the name of the hotel, you would know it. And I was having dinner with him about a year ago and he was telling me about when his wife died. This is a mega, 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 mega hotel. All you all have stayed in these hotels. And said, he said, I want to ask you about when my wife died. When she died, she was screaming. And like her face turned like this. It's just horrible. He's in his 80s. But it's like her face turned this. She looked like it. She looked terrible. She was screaming. 
And he said, my priest said that was when she was going through purgatory and heading into heaven. What do you say? And I said, I'd rather not say. <laughs> but you don't go through purgatory. We can't pray you out of purgatory. You can't write a check to get yourself out of purgatory. It's a lie. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus. And there's only one way to hell, and that's to deny Jesus. And I watch Christians die. Oh, hallelujah. Smiling. My dad, when he went on to be with the Lord, we just had, I was messing with him. I said, you want me to sing? Because he said, I want you to sing. And he loved Merle Haggard. And I said, do you want me to sing Merle Haggard? He said, not tonight. <laughs> and I just started singing songs that he loved. And then I left the room and I said, Dad, I'll see you. And about three hours later, the priest called and said, you need to get up here quick if you want to see your dad alive. He's going, he's going quick. I said, I'll come up in a little bit, but I've already said my goodbyes. And then that priest was so nice when I walked in. He said, I don't want you to be alone. I said, I haven't been alone since my dad introduced me to Jesus. As I looked at my dad's body there in Sunset Hills campus right there at St. Anthony's, you could just tell he was just gone. Because when you die, your spirit comes out of your body. You get to go to heaven instantaneously. And it's a party. And it's amazing. And it's like the best church service you've ever had in your life. Except it never stops. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on forever. And we got a job to do. We got to build some churches. We got to get as many people saved as we can. We got it. We got it any way we can. If we can share it on Facebook, if we can share it on Instagram, if we can get cards to put it everywhere, if we can spray paint our cars, if you can spray paint even the bodies of your car, spray everything, spray paint your motorcycle helmet, everything needs to say it, spray it, wheel it, deal it, and tell everybody that Jesus is coming because the devil is going into schools and to abortion clinics and anywhere he can to kill. But we, Faith Church, we're here to change the world. Tell everybody. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Come on, give Jesus a hand. Stand up with me. Let's make some confessions. Shout, I believe, I believe with all my heart, all my heart that, I'm that I'm protected, I'm anointed, I'm, anointed, I'm, qualified, I'm qualified, I'm living out my purpose. Living out my purpose. Everything God called me to do, me I'm going to get that done. Get that That's done. my number one priority. Number one priority. Whatever I do, to subsidize my finances, my job, that's not my source. It is a source. My source is Almighty God. I'm called to build the church, pray for the church, be a church, love the church, raise my kids in the church. Everything in my life revolves around Jesus and his church. He said, the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. And so therefore, I dedicate my mind, my mouth, my ears, my hands, all my body is dedicated to Jesus. My life is not my own. I'm bought with a price. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And that's why it's disease-free, pain-free, tumor-free. Everything that the enemy tries to put on me, Jesus already took off of me. So I'm blessed and I'm happy about it. And I will never ever have any of the diseases associated with old age. I'll always look, act, and feel 20 years younger than I am. In Jesus' name, amen.